Okay, so I'm going to start this section by just reminding you of something that I said yesterday. Um, but when I watched them play back, I maybe didn't make the point clearly enough. So I'm going to do it again. We want to create inside of our minds a sliding scale of CPTSD. Zero at one side, 10 at the other. And then we want to rate ourselves where 10 is my CPTSD is so strong, I can't function without um, a lot of assistance. I, my, my life doesn't work. I'm, I can't hold down a job. I can't hold down a relationship. My life just does not work. One would be, I can't get motivated. I have serious self-image and self-esteem issues and I don't feel like my life is where it, where it could be. Um, but everything kind of works for me, but life just seems a lot harder for me than it does for other people. When, when I see other people doing the same thing I'm doing, they seem to be able to handle the stress a lot better than I can. That's naught to 10. And in the middle is five. If you're at naught to five, I think you should be able to do these exercises on your own without much trouble. And that you would get very, very far with these exercises if you do do them on, on your own. You'll, you'll get a, a lot of return on your, your investment in terms of time and diligence. From five to 10, if you're rating yourself on a scale of five to 10, which means that you have a significant emotional flashback every day of your life that stops you from doing something you would otherwise do. And you can be like, I am in an emotional flashback right now and it's a significant one. You should only do these exercises with the help of a coach or a counselor. And I am more than happy for you to share any or all of this material with your coach or your counselor to say, this is what I wanna do. Can you please work through some of these techniques with me? Um, not everybody has exactly the same approach, but what I'm showing you on this video, and now I can speak to the coaches and the counselors there, adapt as required. I'm sure you all understand the principles and the essence of what I'm doing. If you're uh, from a particular school of psychotherapy or a school of counseling that does things in a slightly different way, or if you have tools that you think would accelerate what I'm showing here, by all means, please do go and, and, and use them. And if uh, you guys, if the coach and the counselor uh, and the client together, the coach, counselor, therapist and the client together, if you find a really, really cool way of getting the job done, reach out to me, just send me an email and say, hey, we were doing your exercise, but we found that when we did this, it made it even better. Okay. Um, so you need to have established where your level of CPTSD is because this whole section can be extremely challenging and could cause um, uh, some very, very painful emotional flashbacks for people. Just give me one second. Because we're going to be talking about your uh, core relationship, your primal attachment with your parents or, or parents, and this is where a lot of the troubles with CPTSD come from, if you're adapting this for use with clients who are who have been, um, uh, you know, the victims of a crime or they've been kidnapped or they've been tortured whilst in a war zone or something like that, then you're going to have to adapt everything that I'm saying here. But it's not like you'll clearly see how, how you can do that. If you have experienced that, then I don't recommend watching this video without a counselor, no matter where you rate yourself on the scale. If you in adulthood have, have experienced the type of trauma that you think has given you CPTSD in adulthood, you must follow these exercises under the careful guidance of a professional who can let you know when it's too stressful for you. Those of us on a CPTSD scale of zero to five, we know when it's too much and we know when to stop. People at five to 10, they might not know when to stop and they might not know how hard the flashback that comes is, is gonna be. So that's why I recommend doing it this way. Just a recap of yesterday, very, very briefly. This is the eye. This is the gaze of the parent. This is what the child craves the most is the look of the parent it was something that i had missed uh, after i did the recording yesterday i went and watched tv last night and there was a, a scene in a tv show where the little boy is saying to the daddy to his daddy look at me daddy look at me look at me daddy look at me and i'm like oh i don't have kids myself but i've heard that you know at a certain age when they do stuff they're constantly demanding that the, their mother or father looks at them look at me observe me, notice me. It's almost like your gaze as a parent is the sun and in the basking, uh, they can bask in the light of your gaze 
and it allows them to grow like a flower. They need to be validated in a way that is boundaried, in a way that is loving, and in a way that is supportive. As we said yesterday, the bad parent doesn't do that. It either switches the eye off altogether, or it looks in a way that is judgmental, angry, demanding, and critical, and this shrinks the ego down to a very, very small state. It stops the person from maturing, it stops them from developing, it leads them into a, a kind of developmental break, and this is what you're looking at when a client turns up with CPTSD, somebody who has not been permitted uh, to, to grow fully as a human being as into, an, into an adult. They were never given that guidance. All of these things that the bad parent has done are kept inside as recordings. As I said yesterday, it is the things the bad parent said and the way the bad parent made the child feel. So these are feelings, the, the shitty things they made you feel, and words the shitty words they use to make you feel that way. This is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the recordings. For the purpose of this course, I'm gonna keep referring back to the bad parent. The bad parent may be dead, so it's all recordings, but when I say to you recordings, instead of, your when I say bad parent, you know who and what I mean straight away but don't externalize it. This is a part of you. The bad parent existed, or maybe even is still alive. They may have even changed as a human being. I don't know. Done some ayahuasca trips, really found themselves, really let go of all that pain. So the bad, well, I'm gonna keep saying bad parents, but when I'm saying bad parents, it's shorthand for these recordings. This is CPTSD right here in its totality. The recordings that make you feel bad and the, the recordings that make you talk to yourself inside your head in a way that is hypercritical, demanding, and generally unpleasant. This is what we're dealing with. This gaze, um, it's kind of like the eye of Sauron, or the eye of Horus, or the, the, the um, observation of a godlike person. We're gonna get into this in the exercises. When you are a child, and you're very little, your mom or your dad has a God or goddess-like quality to them. That's how powerful they are. So what we are carrying inside of us right now would be like an Old Testament God, vengeful, jealous, competitive, um, prone to rages, prone to narcissistic displays of power. See the book of Job. Um, and we wanna convert that into a New Testament God who is just purely loving, all forgiving, all loving, um, a, a, a constant source of uh, validation, of comfort, uh, of refuge, of um, mercy, a merciful God, as it were. So that's what we're looking to convert inside of ourselves. How are we gonna do that? Because this process in your childhood was a kind of brainwashing, and it went in through a, a kind of hypnosis, I have to do a kind of brainwashing kind of hypnosis with you. Now, when I say the word hypnosis, people get freaked out and they think I'm talking about putting people to sleep and then just putting ideas in their head. If you don't like the word hypnosis, you can think of it as a visualization. We're predominantly going to be using uh, those hypnosis tracks that I've created, but you are also going to be hypnotizing yourself. I, I really would prefer it if you learned the skill of self-hypnosis, which I'm gonna teach you. It's way more simple than you think, so that we can deal with this thing. We need to conquer these recordings. We need to conquer the recordings of the bad parent, okay? And that's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it through using visualization. We're gonna use hypnotic language repatterning, as it's called in uh, neuro-linguistic programming. And I'm going to do a lot of that for you, or at least I'm going to show you how to do that. But then you also need to do it. Now let's make this point right here. When it comes to defeating, this is your enemy. The recordings of CPTSD that are creating the emotional flashbacks and the inner critic, the recordings of the bad parent. This is the enemy. Am I asking you to fight the enemy? Okay, if we fight the enemy, you might get somewhere. Um, in my own personal experience, yeah, you can. So if you notice, if you notice the inner critic come up, you can, in your own head say, that's not very helpful. 
Why are you always saying the worst thing possible? Why do you never say anything encouraging? Go on, say something encouraging. I dare you. I've had this conversation inside of my head. And you might get somewhere. You might find it insightful or it might make you laugh or it might be of some use to some degree. Generally speaking, I haven't found that you get very long lasting results with that. And I really just want to get on with my life. And I really just want to teach people techniques that help them to just get on with their lives. If you have to do this every day in order to just live as normal, well, I guess I would consider it somewhat of a win, but it's not, it's not what I would go around calling a total cure for CPTSD. Because when you fight, it must be conscious. Conscious, God, that looks wrong, conscious. It must be conscious. So two things have to happen here. One, you need to become aware that your inner critic has become activated or you're in an emotional flashback. Really hard, really, really quite difficult. I'm gonna show you how to do it in one of the later sections as it's one of the skill sets we're working on. But if you're in an emotional flashback, as you already know, if you're watching this, emotional flashbacks have their own gravity. They have their own magnetism and they pull you into them before you can consciously have much of a thought about it at all. You're in a critic, easier to spot, but if you're so used to your inner critic chatting to you, you might actually just think this is you. You're so used to it. You're so, it's such an unconscious response. You'd be like, that's just me. That's just how I talk to myself. I don't even notice it as the inner critic. So you have to do step one, which is notice it's happening, which I don't have a massive amount of hope for, especially if you're at scale five to 10 on the spectrum. And two, you have to actually have the will to fight. Where are you gonna get that from? Where are you gonna get it from? Like if you can't buy it from a shop, you can't just just suddenly produce out of nowhere magical willpower. You might notice um, when you're working with a good coach, when you're working with a good therapist, that you do develop a little bit more of a willpower to fight. But when that happens, it's only because they have reparented you, maybe accidentally, maybe not intentionally, to stand up for yourself. So if um, so you've got to notice that the thing is happening and then you have to fight. So if you were raised by somebody like me who is, um, through the weird experience of my life, a bit of an oddball and a bit of an idealist and with a, a strong philosophical leaning, and I think it's important that kids are prepared for adulthood very consciously and very deliberately, and I used to do that as, as a job. So if I had kids or if you had been my child, I would be saying to you, stand up for yourself. You must fight for what you want. You must also ask for what you want. You must be polite. You must be boundaried. This is how to be in the world. And I would tell them how to do that with my words. And those words would play forevermore inside their heads. What an advantage kids with good parents have. I would also instill in them through the cunning use of neuro-linguistic programming and hypnosis. No, no, I, through just being around them and loving them, just through giving them my love. I would go, oh, I love you. And they would go, oh, he loves me. And then they would feel good. They would feel calm. They would feel safe. They would feel secure because that's the way it's supposed to be. That's in accordance with nature. I'm supposed, like you're not supposed to compete with your kids. You're not supposed to hate your kids. It's a perversion and a corruption against nature. This is a psychology video. It sounds a little bit spiritual and a bit philosophical what I just said but I stand by it. Um, so that you would be fine. And also, so you'd be instilled inside of you good feelings, strong feelings, and strong feelings uh, uh, backed by positive words that run inside your head because it's what I've said to you and it's how I've treated you. So if I treat you well and you go, oh, he loves me, so therefore I must be lovable. My mother and my father love me, so therefore I'm lovable, so therefore I'm okay. Then I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay runs inside my head for the rest of my life. If I treat you disparagingly and call you a dickhead all the time, then you'd be like, oh, daddy doesn't think very much of me. I must not be okay. There must be something wrong with me. I'm a dickhead. I'm a dickhead. So he or she will literally say the words, I'm a dickhead. I'm a dickhead. Or they will imply from how I treated them what they are and they will form the words themselves. I'm worthless. I'm worthless. And then they will feel bad. So Two things you have to do if you're going to fight, which I don't recommend as a strategy because, you know, it, it requires conscious effort. 
one, you must notice when it comes up, and two, you, you have to actually then go ahead and fight it. And you can, you can adopt a combative stance against the inner critic, and you can adopt a combative stance against emotional flashbacks, but both of these things are an effort of will. The science is in on willpower. It's a finite resource. Whether it's dieting, whether it's business, whether it's recovering from emotional flashbacks, anybody can get really good results by developing their will, by strengthening their will, and then applying their will in a direction. And then, but no matter how strong or how big a bank account of will you've developed, it's always a finite resource. I like to do things that are unconscious because they work much more elegantly. They require no remembrance that this is happening. They require no effort on my part to actually do something about what is going on. I can just get on with my day and the unconscious just sorts all of this stuff out for me. That's why I'm recommending that you um, work with me and work with your coach and your therapist to look at unconscious training or tra training of the unconscious using hypnotic language patterns. If you don't like hypnosis, we won't call it hypnosis. You could say visualizations. Um, and the way to do it instead of by fighting, I'm calling it flooding. So this whole process is parental inner parent repatterning. You have recordings playing that are patterns that are literally, they're literally, and I'm using the word literally correctly here, uh, neural pathways that have been laid down through trauma and repetition in your childhood when you had a lot of um, brain plasticity, the most brain plasticity that you will ever have in your life was when you were a little child and your brain was just open and just ready to learn straight away without questioning. As we get older, it, it stiffens, it, it becomes harder and we lose that, plasti that brain plasticity. Your brain, as it learns, literally changes shape. It doesn't like turn into a cube or something, but at the tiny, tiniest levels deep inside, there are little things going on that are changing shape. So this could be seen as um, like a little, oh no, I've started a drawing. I don't know how to draw neural networks. I've drawn myself into a corner. This then links to this, then links to this. Everything that we do, the way our whole brain works is through association, through neural associations. The color green is like grass. The blue is like water, I don't know. Um, so it's this is like that, and that's how a connection is formed. So these recordings are here, and we need to change the actual neural pathways that are firing off, that are creating these emotional flashbacks, that are causing the words to fire off. This is all unconscious, by the way. So is there, how, how far are we gonna get fighting an unconscious, a non-conscious impulse? You've been doing this since childhood, or it was done to you since childhood. These are, these are running, these are firing. You're an expert in running these neural pathways. These neural pathways are, are well trod as a pathway, shall we say, to hyperextend the metaphor. They're very, very well trod. And now I'm saying, well, we need to complete, we need to um, get rid of them. So what do you do when you want to lay down a new neural pathway? Do you need to go in there and chop these out? No, because your brain is extremely clever at certain things. In other ways, it operates in a way that's quite annoying and keeps a lot of people in therapy for a very, very long time. Because the brain developed very, very, very rapidly in a way that was unprecedented compared to any other animal and grew in volume at a, a huge, an absurdly fast rate. And it grew in volume, we think, uh, well, we think, scientists believe, um, partly because we learned to cook, so we got more, more and better calories in, and because we were traveling. So your brain might be, this is theoretical, but this is what mainstream science generally agrees on, the brain grew in size so rapidly because of the development of language and travel so that we could map different areas around us. And it's very good at mapping terrains. You know, all of us are pretty good at intricately mapping a physical terrain. It's not really designed for mapping the emotional terrain. It's not really designed for mapping trauma, which is why trauma exists in a weird, hard to see place. 
which is why you get a sense of relief when I draw stuff out like this and you go, that looks quite simple. This issue I've been living with for such a long time, he makes it look quite straightforward. It gives you relief because then when something is straightforward and it's laid out in front of you, like as you're sat there right now, I'm tiny. In real life, I'm, I'm not this small, right? You know that, right? This is a screen. And this also becomes small. We know from NLP, from Neuro Linguistic Programming, when things are made smaller, it makes you feel calmer about them and like you're in control of them. So this is all we're dealing with. We're not going to fight the conscious, we're not going to consciously fight these recordings to try and get new neural pathways laid down. That's not how the brain works anyway. We, you don't have to go in and kill neural pathways before you can grow new ones. No, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, it does not work like that. I'm not a neurologist and this is way outside of my field of, of expertise, but I know that that's not how the brain works. If you want to learn tennis, you don't have to kill the neural pathways of ping pong in order to get there, right? If you're good at ping pong, then you go learn tennis. If anything, you might end up using the same pathways and developing them in new ways. That's what the brain is good at. That's what humans generally are good at. Making stuff on the fly, improvising. Making this, because I said, it's all about association. Oh, this ping pong bat. It's actually closer to a tennis bat than I realized. And the principles of the game are the same. And so your brain goes, how is this the same? And it's called skills transference. And it just brings the skills from over here to over there so that you can learn new things. Okay, so what are we gonna do with this? We're gonna flood it. We are gonna flood the unconscious with new messages and a new idea. Now, exactly what those messages are and what the new idea is, I'm going to explain to you now briefly because it's weird but I need you to understand why we're gonna do this weird thing before we do it. When you're doing the visualizations, the hypnotic repatterning uh, process that you know I've given you in audio form, there's nothing to it. You can change it if you want to and you can hypnotize yourself at any moment in time. Self-hypnosis, I'm gonna teach you in two easy steps. Go into a relaxed state. Nobody under hypnosis has no idea what's going on. That never happens unless you're using drugs to hypnotize people as well, in which case it's not really uh, normal hypnosis. You'll be fully aware of everything that's going on. You'll just be relaxed. How relaxed? In order for hypnosis to work, I used to do, some people do 10 minute long inductions to get people relaxed and into trance. Because of NLP, I was taught to do fast inductions and we would be like, oh, just a minute is long enough. A minute? is unnecessary. Five seconds is quite enough. There's only a depth of trance that you need to go to for clear, plain, simple messages to go in, and it's not deep. So say for example, as you're sat there right now, I'll give you a really, really uh, simple thing. Look at your hand, look at the swirls and the patterns on your hand, Take a deep breath in, let your eyes defocus, and listen to me now. You're now in a very, very super, super light state of trance. It's just a slightly altered state of consciousness, and you'll be thinking, am I? This just feels like normal consciousness. Inside of your head, all you need to do now is not out loud, inside your head, say, I can learn to feel better now. I can learn to feel really Good, now. And stop, eyes open, back in the room, everything's fine. That whole process took about 25 seconds. And you'll go, you'll be, you'll be totally underwhelmed by it. You'll be like, that's not hypnosis. I've seen it in films. People go into a trance and they wake up and then you go, um, the yellow mockingbird flies in June and then they go and kill the prime minister of Malaysia. That's how hypnosis works. It's, it's nonsense, boys and girls, it's total gibberish. Go into a very light state of trance Give yourself a clear message, not in the negative. So you would never say, don't feel bad now. You'd say, feel good now. That's it. This self-hypnosis I just taught you inside of probably about three minutes, relaxed, clear messages over and over and over again. The over and over and over again bit is important. What are we going to be doing in these tracks? Well, there's a part of you I knew, I'd, I knew I was gonna stumble. I wasn't gonna say the word part. Ah, 
There's a part of you that is currently functioning, that is currently malfunctioning. You'll hear about something called parts therapy at, at times. You know, it's, it's, it's prevalent in, in hypnosis and different schools of counseling uh, use it. You can just be a specialized parts therapist. It's a very, very useful way of thinking about how the human being works. We have different parts. Sometimes those parts have different goals and different ambitions and they get into fights with each other and we have to resolve those fights. This part of you, in parts therapy, it is assumed that every part has a positive intent. In this case, the part, the part of you that is operating came purely from trauma and it has no positive intent. It is looking to destroy you. I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm just telling you that you must take this seriously. It's a parental part of you. So when you go there, in your mind, in your brain, it has power over you. So when we are visualizing and when we're doing the hypnotic process, I'm gonna be asking you to flood yourself with positive and loving messages. Don't worry about what they are. It will all be given to you in the audio hypnosis. But you're going to be imagining that you are a child and that, that means you're short and that these loving messages are coming, you're, you're knee high to a giant and the giant is behind you and that is either mummy or daddy. When you do the exercise, I suggest you, when you actually do the audio hypnosis, when you put your earphones in and listen to me going through the audio hypnosis, choose which parent you think did the most damage to do this with first and you're gonna reimagine that parent, and you're gonna imagine them behind you, much, much taller than you, and that you are, this is all very, this is called, uh, um, these are internal representations. It's to take you back to childhood. That's why I said, if you're on a naught to five, you should be okay doing this on your own. If you're at a five to 10, you're gonna need a counselor with you. You're gonna need a therapist who knows you to guide you through this. If at any point it brings you into an emotional flashback, stop. Don't push through it. Just stop the whole process. Take a time out, deal with the emotional flashback, and then in your own time, only as quickly as you're comfortable doing it, try it again. So you're going to imagine receiving these messages from a loving parent who is bigger than you. Don't ask me why this is important, just trust me it's important. And they're going to be giving you these messages. It is to put you back in childhood, in a childlike state, which means you won't be able to refuse them. If we don't do it like this, the inner critic will jump up and block it and go, no, we're not having that. The inner critic is a manifestation of the bad parent. So imagine right now you have two gods above you. Sorry if this is offensive to some people. You have a good one and a bad one. If we don't do it like this, if we don't put the good God above you, but we put them next to you, the bad God will block them. I, I'm using God metaphorically. This is not a spiritual course. This is all psychology. This is just how we process it as human beings. You're going to uh, um, be, be receiving the messages from the parental figure, not as you today, Not as you, the ego in the present moment, but as the child in your childhood. That's why we're doing it. If we try to send messages to you as the ego today, then what will happen is the inner critic will jump up and say no, no. But when we do it like this, where we imagine that it's a, a, a parental figure, I keep saying God, God, parent, figure above us saying it down, the inner critic won't be able to stop it. It bypasses the inner critic, it also bypasses the conscious mind, and it will work straight away. I then just need you to remember to be doing it frequently. Please try the audio hypnosis now, and then come back for the next section, uh, uh, the next video in this section. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully, for most of us, that will have been um, a, a pleasant surprise. Uh, it should have been a very, very positive experience, better than you thought it would be. It's set up in a certain way for a particular reason. There's no need for me to get into that in this particular course. I'm only here 
to help you to recover. And this course is only here to help you to recover. That is a state that I recommend um, you access at least once a day. I would also recommend that you listen to that audio hypnosis or audio visualization, if you prefer, every day for seven days so that your brain starts to go, oh, okay, I know where you want me to go now. Oh, okay, I know what you need from me right now. Then after that, listen to it only as and when you feel like you need to be reminded um, of that feeling of being flooded with those feelings of validation and of love and of noticing how that makes you feel. So stay curious, stay proactive. Don't just be a receiver of information or a receiver of help. Help yourself, learn who you are, be curious about your own recovery and start to come up with your own ideas. What I would like you to do is grab hold of a pen and a piece of paper if you can, or you can write it in the notes on your smartphone if that's more convenient for you. I'd like you to make a list of the good feelings that you felt during that audio hypnosis that you are not used to feeling and that you didn't know having a good parent presence inside of yourself would make you feel. Typically, people report that they feel supported and they're surprised that they're like, oh, I didn't realize that having a positive, loving parent by me would make me feel supported. Um, supported or backed up or um, not alone, not so alone in the world. <laughs> you know, that feeling of there is somebody with me who loves me, who cares about me and is encouraging me to move forward. People often tell me that they feel encouraged from the experience of feeling like they have a loving father or mother figure, presumably you chose the parent that you had the most problems with and that you went with that. So you would have chosen either a, an idealized super loving mother figure or an idealized super loving father figure. Do the exercise again and again with both parents. So do it for a super idealized mother and a super idealized father. See how that changes the feelings, come back and in your list, you go, oh, when I did it with a, with a mother instead of a father, it made me feel more able to access my own emotions. It made me to feel more love for, it made me able to feel more love for other people. When I did it for my father, for a father, keep your father out of it. We don't want to get back into that mess, do we? Keep your mother out of it. When I did it for the idealized father figure, it made me feel stronger. It made me feel more assertive. Maybe it might, you know, whatever it is, whatever, it, whatever it makes you feel. This is what I want you to write down. Supported, encouraged. Some people note that depression lifts. That depressed, heavy feeling, just by feeling loved and supported, they actually start accessing childlike feelings of excitement and inspiration. And then when they keep doing the exercise, they find themselves like, I've had people go, going back to playing sport that they haven't played in 20 years or something. Some connection there seems to be between the parental approval or disapproval and our capacity to go out and, and thrive in the world. When the parents are disapproving or very shaming or very mocking or very dismissive, it's hard for us to learn that we have the right to go out and just have fun. You know, people have, have taken off uh, traveling from this exercise, not after the first attempt, but after repeated exposure to this exercise, I've seen that. So whatever you're feeling, Whatever emotions come up from that exercise, you know, just also euphoria. I've had people crying with, with te like happy tears. Like this is how it should feel. This is how life should feel all the time. I've, I've been I'm dying of thirst my whole life and I've just had a drink kind of feeling. So write down the feelings it makes you feel, get curious about that and notice how the opposite has been true. So if I'd say I wrote down, <clears throat> typical things, but imagine this is all my feeling. Supported, encouraged, excited, and joyful. That meant before the exercise, or generally speaking, I feel unsupported and alone, discouraged, devalued. Uh, um, what's the opposite of being encouraged? If you don't encourage a child, you... Discouraged, mocked, perhaps shamed. The opposite of excited, kind of be depressed, or depressive, or uh, bored, or lazy, or apathetic perhaps excited and inspired, I said, and the opposite of joyful would be sad. 
You just feel sad all the time. And notice that and be curious about that and go, damn, I actually have a baseline feeling of sadness. Yeah. If you're raised in an abusive environment, if you're raised with a lack of parental love, baseline feelings of sadness are almost inevitably going to be the result. It makes sense, right? This isn't, nothing here is like, ooh, that's shocking. But we're putting things, they're putting the jigsaw, the puzzle back together in a certain way that serves us. For whatever time we've got left on the planet, it would be nice to be feeling more of this stuff, right? The good feelings. Whatever time, we can't go back to childhood unless I invent a time machine, unless I get hold of a TARDIS and undo it for you. But we can do this. We can reduce the CPTSD symptoms. We can make you uh, uh, feel feelings of love and support and encouragement and make it easier for you to go out and enjoy the rest of your life. In order to thicken the neural pathways to make this something that your brain unconsciously does. Do this every day, write it out for seven days, not for the rest of time, for seven days. Give it, give it seven days to really grind that groove in and then you'll just start doing it. You'll just start going there. So in a situation, you spill a glass of water. I'm, the inner critic used to be, you fucking idiot, swearing, you know, totally inappropriate language that you should never you know, shove in a child's face. Fucking idiot, what did you fucking do that for? Might now be, oops, never mind, let's quickly clean that up and get on with whatever we were doing. Just, just a do, do. Oh, you're a piece of shit, you're worthless. Oh, no, we'll just get on with the rest of our day. And you might not notice it until afterwards where you'd be like, oh, normally I'd really beat myself up for that poor piece of parking, that strange social interaction I had, or and now you're not. You're just not beating yourself up. You're just going, oh well, never mind, shrugging it off. Oh, that sounds like something else. That sounds like something that, that we call resilience and mental toughness. Huh, huh, does that mean that people who have had good parents behind them are naturally more resilient and mentally tougher? Hmm, I wonder. What are the good attributes of the perfect parent that you would wish to instill? It's your fantasy, it's your brain, it's your body, you get to do whatever the hell you want. My perfect parental figure will be, uh, good attributes will be uh, loving and kind, fair and just, um, strong, and supportive, not dismissive and cruel, not um, uh, changing rules for one child and making them for something else or having one rule one day and one rule another, not weak, addicted and um, non-supportive and dismissive. What are the good attributes? What do you, what, what would make you feel even more flooded with love safety, encouragement, joy, excitement, support from the parental figure. What would you like to see from them? What would you like to feel from them? What kind of, a, of an individual would you want that person to be? How do you strengthen this fantasy? How do you strengthen this uh, tulpa? You can look the word tulpa up if you want. T-U-L-P-A. I learned it through watching Twin Peaks, but it's actually a concept from Tibetan Buddhist magic. This is a course on psychology and sometimes I say things just to break state and do pattern, this is what I'm speaking to the coaches and the therapists, to break state, to pattern interrupt. Massive amounts of my work, if you're, if you're really looking at what I'm doing, is about interrupting patterns and altering people's states um, and getting them to think about subjects in a new way. So break the paradigm, break the state, break the pattern, find something new. When the brain has the option of finding something new, it'll usually choose something better. People make shit decisions and choose bad things because they're not being given the option. So I give options. I go, here you go, what would you like? And then the client will usually go, ha, huh, I think I like something that doesn't suck. And I have an attitude that encourages people to think that I want them to choose things that don't suck. I don't have like a, um, a, judge, a judgmental <laughs> or patronizing attitude. So I'm like, do whatever you think would be nice. And they'll go, okay, I'll totally do that. This, um, not, it's not just, it's not like, a, 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 it's just a way of cheaply building rapport with a client. It's a way of actually 
uh, healing the client in themselves to a point where they don't need me anymore, where they're just like, I'm not gonna, I don't need you for work anymore, goodbye, and then they leave. Um, which should be the end goal of everybody's coaching and therapy, is to get the client to happily and joyfully and independently leave. The good phrase, okay. The, so we had the good feeling, the good attributes, and the good phrase. The good phrase is gonna be something that you would most want to hear on a day-to-day -day basis from a good, loving, supportive parent. So I will give you an example. It might be something like, um, uh, um, it could be it could be something encouraging like uh, go on you can do it uh, you're good enough good smart pretty some parents you know tell their kids that they're ugly you're good smart pretty enough to do it You deserve it. It's okay and safe to try or whatever. So I want you to think in terms of phrases you've he heard. I nearly went a bit scouse then. My regional accent nearly came through. I try and control it. Phrases you've heard. Phrases that you have heard parents say to their children that you think that's a good phrase i wish my parents had said that to me or that's a good sentiment i wish my parents had come you can just come with sentiment like the sentiment of encouragement the sentiment of support you know no matter what you do we'll love you and we're here for you you can always come back to us and you'll always receive that love encouragement you can do it get out there make it happen you have easily got all of the abilities inside of you to make everything that you want happen go for it kid um, that kind of thing. Get creative. What can't, what, you know, just sit there and go, like, imagine sometimes when people, when I say in a psychological context, I say people get creative and they're like, oh, I don't know how to do that. Well, imagine you did. Imagine you're a writer and you're writing a novel or a story and there's a good mother in the story and the little child is frightened and they're worried about doing a thing and then the good mother is going to say something to the little child that's good and encouraging. Go on, you can do it. Well, that was easy to write. You're good enough, you're smart enough, you're pretty enough to do it. You deserve it. It's okay and safe for you to try. That then becomes easier, doesn't it? If I set the context up that way, you could write stuff all day. I'd be like, what would a, in, in a story that we're writing, we have a really good mom that really loves their little girl or their little boy and they want to say something to the child who is frightened to make the child feel braver. What are they going to say? So on and so forth. So do it like that. So I want you to check in as you learn on the emotional literacy course, or if you've not done the emotional literacy course, as you will learn, I'm big on people checking in with their feelings and actually writing lists of adjectives that describe emotions. This is so you're acknowledging what's going on in the emotional processing unit which is essential that we switch it back on if you want to recover from CPTSD. Your emotions count. Your emotions, I'm being the good parent now. Your emotions count, kid. Your emotions count. So we keep acknowledging how we feel and we keep acknowledging our emotions. Here, we're thickening the neural pathway, not that it's gonna need much thickening because there's so much good feeling, because you're flooding your body with good feelings, your brain's gonna learn this really, really quick. But what are the good attributes you would like to see from the perfect uh, idealized parent? Write them down, they can change day to day. If you want, it's your fantasy, it's, in, it's going on inside of your brain and it's there to support you. This is your simulation unit between your ears. Whatever you want, whatever you think would be helpful to you. You might, um, like all of everything I've said so far is quite fluffy. But uh, you might actually feel like, God, I wish I wish I had a parent who was like like way more militant and strict. And, the, and, and, you know, I had a parent who showed me love, but they were so floppy. I wish they were just like, listen, 
in order for you to get done what it is that you need to get done, you gotta do this, this, and this, and this is the way we're gonna do it. So get up and let's make this happen. You might want, you might be craving like, um, uh, what would we call that? Like assertive, it might, this is all quite yang energy. Maybe you need, uh, sorry, yin energy. You might want some classical yang energy from the mother or from the father. The, the gender doesn't really matter. It's, it's like, if you go, how would I feel if my mum had been stronger? If you feel, you, f you feel your emotions, wow, that would be amazing. God, if only my mum was more assertive. If my idealized mother figure behind me and above me was more assertive, I would have felt so much safer. Boom, you nailed it. Okay, let's do that. Let's see, let's see what that experiment is. If uh, it could be the father. Um, uh, <laughs> in, in, in my case, I noticed this from, from playing a video game. Um, it was a really, really sad moment in my life. Uh, where the in the video game, it was a military video game, I was being um, following around in a game, in a video game. This is how out of touch with my emotions and my trauma I was. An older soldier is teaching you in the first person, the younger soldier, where to go. And I went into, I wouldn't even, I don't even know whether it was a, a, an emotional flashback or if it was just grief. I just started crying and I was like, oh shit. And it was the, it was the, um, it wasn't, the, the lovingness and the kindness was kind of implicit in that the older soldier was showing me what to do. So they care enough about you to show you what to do. That wasn't really it. And it was the, it was, it was more about the presence and the support. And it was from a strong assertive character so don't get um don't get there is no implicit doctrine here whatever this is is what you need whatever this is is what you need you you determine it so don't think because i wrote loving and kind first that that's what you need the most of whatever you need the most of is whatever your emotional processing system your emotional navigation system says i actually wish i i'd had a very shy this could be you could be anyone could be a client Dude, I actually had a very loving father, but he was so shy and so ineffective and so lazy and he was a drunk. I really wish he'd been more stronger and more assertive or that, or maybe it is loving and kindness. Maybe it is justice that was missing. You determine what was missing and uh, that's what you put in there. It's really, you know, and you get feedback from your own feelings, from the emotional processing and emotional navigation unit, that's your feelings, about what these different things make you feel, and that's what you go with. The good phrase could be anything, but pick one and work that for a few days. So, and keep it simple. Go on, you can do it. You're good enough to. If you can't think of one right now and you can't write one down, just write one down. But imagine you couldn't, I would say do this. Go on, you can do it. You're good enough, you got this. And then regularly, you would flood your system five or six times a day in a working day or any time where you're feeling a little bit down, you would flood the system by saying that phrase, imagining the phrase is being said by the idealized parent from behind and above. Go on, you can do it. You're good enough. You can make this work. And it's said with love and it's said with compassion and it's said with support or assertiveness or whatever it is that you've decided you need to be feeling more of. Okay. Um, that is it for that section. There is a second audio hypnosis. It would be good if you could please go and listen to that straight away. It's uh, shorter than the first. Um, I'm not going to explain it. You will hear what it is and uh, then you can use that as and whenever you need to. Um, it's, it's only going to be, it's, it's like four or five minutes long. And the purpose of it is if you very, very quickly want to dip into that space, but you don't want to do like the 12, 15 minute long hypnosis, you just want a four or five minute quick blast, then that's what you use it for. Okay, um, please go and listen to that now and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed uh, that part of the course. I don't know if enjoyed is the right word. The work that we're doing here obviously is very, very um, intense work. 
And what we're trying to do is trying to heal a wound that some of us are carrying very, very deep inside of us. How long will this take is a question I'm often asked. I really don't know. It depends on where you're up to. With this particular course, where we're looking at uh, parental repatterning and actually feeling like there is a good parent, a supportive parent there, you should expect this to take a number of reps. Even if you're on the lower end of the CPTSD scale, I don't think you would want to do this exercise less than 20, day, uh, 20 times on 20 different days. I would think that would be the bare minimum. If you want to get through this course as quickly as possible, I would say run, that, um, run the hypnosis, do one of the hip, hypnotic inductions in the morning, one of them in the evening, and do it over and over and over again. Listen, if it clicks for you, and you feel your emotional flashbacks have already started to go down, if you feel the inner critic is, is now not coming up as much and you're actually, you're actually hearing a loving and supportive parental figure, which would be the primary object, like the unconscious now has the template for a loving, supportive, mature, caring um, uh, parent, and you feel that, then you can start to lay off the course and be like, okay, I don't need to listen to that audio hypnosis as much. I don't need to do that exercise as much. Um, and then if you get into trouble further down the road, you can always come back to it. I would say please do it about 20 times. The reason being is, as I said to you in the very beginning of this course, it is a kind of brainwashing. It's a kind of hypnosis that's been done to you in childhood. So what we're trying to do quite consciously, you and I, plus your, uh, a coach or counselor if possible as well, is trying to re-brainwash you into a new way of seeing things and a new way of feeling about the world. The process um, is called, I'm calling it flooding, because I want to flood your biochemical system with different uh, uh, feelings, with a different biochemistry, so that you actually feel loved, so that you feel supported, so that you can feel how that affects every single aspect of the total energy system that you are. If you're doing this work in conjunction with the other courses, you know, you, if you're working your emotional literacy, if you're working your state management, if you're crushing your emotional flashback drills, you know, you should be looking at a CPTSD recovery that is like this rather than like this, you know, bumping and then down and then back and then, meh. you know, it should be bump where you go, okay, I started the course, I started working it and I just went for it. I went all in and I went for it and I drilled it to this is where I am now. It's a strange thing to do, but that's why, you know, we want to think of this as being something totally new, something totally different. Flooding also um, is so that uh, for me as like a mnemonic, as something that I can remember that, that um, holds the process in place for me, which is that when you are looking to color a piece of cloth, the way they used to do it in the olden days, was that somebody would be a dyer. That's why you have the surname dyer around, is somebody would actually take the cloth and their job, his or her job, would be to dip it in colored paint over and over and over again. They dip it in, let it dry, dip it back in and let it dry again, and dip it back in and let it dry again. That was so that the material soaked up all of that color. This is what we need to be doing. We need you to soak up feelings of being supported. We need you to soak up the archetype of a loving primal object, of a loving parent, of a loving godlike figure or goddess-like figure inside of you so that you feel like you have worth, so that you feel loved, protected, confident, and encouraged to move forward in the world. Thank you for having the bravery to uh, go through this course. Thank you for getting a hold of this course and just showing the decisiveness and commitment to make a change and say, right, I'm gonna fight back. I'm not gonna let CPTSD run my life or ruin my life. I'm gonna actually fight back and start to take a hold of my own healing. Please work the process over and over again. As far as this video goes, leave it a week and then just don't rewatch the whole first two videos again. Just put them back on say in like a week's time, whatever your day is there, wherever you are in, in time and space right now, and you go, okay, in about a week's time, I'll bang on video one and two, and I'll just skip through, and at random parts, I'll just stop it for a minute, 
see what he's saying. I'll go, oh yeah, I remember how I thought about that a week ago and how do I feel about that now? Skip it again. Oh, I remember how I felt about that a week ago. That's also a way of um, dying, die, you know, using the dying process of coming in and back out in and back out in hypnosis, that's called fractionation. When I speak to you, when you watch these videos, it's a kind of, um, uh, it's full, they're full of post-hypnotic suggestions, it's a kind of trance work, it's a kind of visualization work. So please come back to the videos in a week's time. You don't have to sit there and listen to it end to end. As fascinating a public speaker and skilled as I am, um, I wouldn't ask you to do that and you don't need to. Just come back, watch video one, skip through it to five different points, and have a little look, maybe take a few notes and or just mental notes and go, ha, I feel differently about what he's saying now, or ha, hmm, I, I actually think I understand better about what he was actually saying at that point now. Do the same with video two, crack on with, your, with the hypnosis, and as ever, keep checking in with how you feel. Keep checking in with how different ways of doing the visualization is making you feel different things. We want to be moving you away from shame, helplessness, rage, the desire to flee, and feeling really unmotivated and lazy, back into the place where you feel passionate, where you feel strong, where you feel righteous, where you feel driven, committed, and like you have a higher purpose in life. When you're moving in that direction, that's your internal emotional navigation system, which you know about because you've watched the emotional literacy course, the internal, um, uh, Emotional, the internal emotional navigation system is going, hey, this feels good, let's move over here. This feels good, let's do it this way. Listen to those signals, work with those signals, and work the program. Okay, thank you very much for your time and for your attention, and um, I look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you.